What's going on, everybody? We are back again. It's a Sooners Illustrated podcast, episode 17 on this Monday, September the 11th, 2023. Josh Calloway, Tom Green, no James Jackson today, busy, tied up, knocking out some other stuff on the site for us. So it's going to be just me and TG uh, today. If you want to get James's thoughts on the game, of course, you can always go back to our wrap that we did on the field, James and I, on Saturday night. But as for today's show, Tom and I are going to lay it all out. We're going to do our full recap and reaction of the SMU game on Saturday. Tom, we're two weeks in. First road game, if you can call it. I mean, it's kind of a it's a road game, but not a half road game this weekend. How are we feeling? Things are going pretty well so far, I think. Yeah, I mean, Oklahoma's 2-0. That's... You know that's where they want to be. It wasn't always pretty on Saturday, and we'll we'll get into that here shortly. Sure. But, sure. You know they're two and zero, and that's what matters right now. Um, some things to build on, some some positives on both sides of the ball, but two and zero. That's what matters. Yeah, and you know we talked about it, James and I, in our our post game recap a little bit. Two and zero, and they did cover the spread on Saturday. It didn't really feel like it uh, at all, at all times, but. Some positives, some negatives. Like you said, that's what the show is for today. We're going to get into all the ins and outs of it. Um, we'll also look ahead. We'll peer ahead just a little bit at the tail end of the show. And we will very briefly touch on the 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 circus aftermath of the game on Saturday. I think you know what I'm referring to there. We're not going to talk about it real long at all, I promise you. this is We're going to talk about football. But we will address that just a little bit on the tail end on the way out as well. But let's go ahead and get into the game. So Oklahoma, like we said, is 2-0. They beat SMU on Saturday, 28-11. Um, the defense continues to do the job. I mean, you're talking about 11 total points in two games. That's going to put you in pretty good uh, positions to win. I think five and a half points per game is, is going to be pretty good. Um, offensively, it was weird, and we'll get into that in just a bit. But, Tom, let's start with the good. Let, let's get on the bright side here. We, we went into the weekend. We talked about it on last week's show on Thursday – the game preview show that SMU, unlike Arkansas State, has playmakers. They have guys who can actually make things happen, both at the wide receiver position. They have a good running back. This young quarterback, Preston Stone, he looked pretty darn good to me on Saturday. He had some really nice throws under duress, and yet they didn't get into the end zone until the fourth quarter. Only eleven total points on Saturday. I'm, I'm still, I'm treading lightly, but this defense. Feels like it might actually be good. What what was your impressions on Saturday watching this this defense for the most part shut SMU down? Yeah, I think the big thing for the defense is you know think back to what Ted Roof said two weeks ago before the season opener when he was asked about what he wants to see from the defense, and it's basically proof of concept. You want mm. to see them trending in the right direction, and through two weeks they are certainly there. I mean, Arkansas State might be the worst team in FBS. So, you know, take with a grain of salt, <laughs> shutting that yeah. out for four quarters. But Oklahoma went three quarters without giving up a touch – or seven quarters without giving yeah. up a touchdown to open the season. They haven't done that in forever. That'll do, yeah. Um, and even that one touchdown that they gave up, that was aided by three penalties that just extended Good the point. drive. Um, you, know, you had a couple pass interference calls there. You had a penalty on uh, Brent Venables for sideline interference. <laughs> Um, and that's that's the one that really you know moved SMU you know down to the ten yard line basically and set up that touchdown. Um, so I mean the, the defense has to feel real good about it right now. Obviously, there's some areas that they need to improve on. You know they need to continue to kind of develop that pass rush, get those yeah get some more push up front with that defensive line because that's an area that's been a little bit of lack a little bit lacking so far. But man, they got to be pleased with their secondary has played great. I mean they they gave up. You know, a handful of bigger plays. Linebackers played great. Danny Stutzman was everywhere. Everywhere. Jaron Kanick's still growing into that role, but mm -hmm. like what you've seen from him, from Kip Lewis, Brent Venables had a lot of praise for him after the game. Um, but just this defense as a whole, I mean, even when they gave up big yardage plays, I think SMU finished with nine chunk plays, which, you know, passes of 15-plus yards and runs of 10-plus yards. Every time they did that, Oklahoma's defense had an answer. You know, yeah. You look at the first quarter. Um, Billy Bowman had that tight coverage in the end zone to pretty much save a touchdown. Second quarter, Jaron Kanick had a pass breakup on a fourth down play. Third quarter, Key Lawrence poking that ball out after the end of like a twenty-five yard run to force a turnover. 
fourth quarter, Justin Harrington's interception seals it. And right before, you know, the drive before that, Peyton Bowen had a pass breakup that could have very well been a pick six of his own. I mean, they, they found ways to make plays and step up when they needed to. You know, they gave up yardage here and there. But again, 11 total points through two games. Yeah. And when you look at that touchdown drive that they gave up where, you know, a lot of it was aided by penalty yardage, this defense has been, I think, a lot better than anybody really expected, even considering the competition that they played. Yeah, defense has been salty so far, and you got a couple of turnovers, uh, like you kind of referred to Harrington, the pick to seal it, and that Key Lawrence forced fumble uh, with Stuck and was- Dovon, fantastic play. And that came when SMU was driving a little bit. And also came right in that stretch of the game where the offense was doing nothing. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's hard not to be really impressed. And they feel like they're physical. Um, they're tackling well. I mean, like you said, Danny Stutzman, 17 total tackles uh, on Saturday. was named Big 12 uh, Defensive Player of the Week just a little bit earlier today. He's playing everywhere. great. Kip Lewis was everywhere again. He continues to be a ball magnet, like we said a bunch of times. Like Venables has called him. You know, like you said, too, that secondary – I wrote about this in my field vision on Sunday morning. I, the, the secondary not that long ago was a massive liability, and it's just not right now. Now, is it perfect? No, but it's not this glaring issue either. I mean, Woody Washington, you know how many uh, completions he's given up so far through two games? Goose egg. He's shutting down his man so far. Gentry Williams went down. He's a little banged up. That's a tough one. We'll get an update from Brent Venables probably on his presser on Tuesday about – where he is right now, but even despite Williams being out, Kanai Walker's playing great. He he continues to step up. Um, we kind of, I don't want to say we overlooked Kanai Walker, but he was a little bit of the forgotten man. There was all this hype about Jenshu Williams and Kendall Dolby and Josiah Wagner, this freshman. Kanai Walker is playing really well right now. Key Lawrence was everywhere. Like I said, had that big force fumble. Peyton Bowen continues to be a star. I mean, people are, are doing Roy Williams comparisons already for Peyton Bowen, saying so he's, you know, which is that's a really, really high bar already, but right. <laughs> not that far fetched either in terms of what he is already, you know, in game two. I mean, I think we all kind of feel like, yeah, that kid's going to be a star. He already is kind of becoming one. There's just not, you know, like you said, the pass rush, Preston Stone was running for his life at many times this game, but they had a hard time getting home. Only one sack that was courtesy of Stutzman. So they have two total sacks in two games. You're going to need that to ramp up, but they're getting close. You know, like I said, he was running around. They just couldn't quite get home. So you, I think it's reasonable to stay optimistic there. But other than that, you know, there's n- really almost nothing to complain about defensively uh, through two games so far, which is you got to like that if you're an OU fan. What a start for this group. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest things that I've noticed, um, they're just tackling really well. Mm-hmm. You know, through two games, I think they have seven combined missed tackles. They averaged, really 13, number. They, yeah. they averaged 13 per game last season. <laughs> I mean, wow. they're, they're, yeah. they're just playing yeah. more fundamentally sound football. You know, they, they want to clean up the penalties on both sides of the ball. And I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that on the offense, too. Because, you know, this is one of the most penalized teams in the country so far through two mm-hmm. weeks. So they, they need to clean that up because, you know, like Brent Venable said after the game, if you don't take care of the basics, they'll find a way to punish you. That hasn't cost Oklahoma yet. We saw a little glimpse of it on that touchdown drive by SMU. But for the most part, Oklahoma has been able to kind of overcome its own little mistakes. Um, but yeah, overall, I mean, defense has been stellar through two games. Yeah. Uh, they're they're plus three in turnover margin too. Yeah, no, it has. I mean, offense hasn't turned it over. Defense has forced three so far. I mean, that's what you want to see. That is win- that is a winning formula. Yeah. No, I mean, like we said, I mean, you, you want to see those sack numbers come along, but obviously if you watch the game, you know, Stone, I mean, Preston Stone, give him credit. I left him pressed on Saturday. He had several times where he back foot just kind of dropping it in the bucket like he had some really under duress nice throws uh, on saturday brent venables um, said he yeah. kind of reminded him of jackson arnold i mean that's that's pretty yeah. high, high we price. know what he thinks of arnold yeah right. yeah we, we, yeah we know what that staff thinks of jackson arnold so to say that he kind of reminds him of jackson arnold that's you know no light praise there that is that is some high praise for a guy that i think is going to end up having a pretty good season um i think smu is as an offense, is going to put up some numbers this year. Um, and I think that it's probably the best offense that Oklahoma is going to face between now and the Red River. Yeah, for, for sure. Um, you know, we talked about LJ Johnson had that big opener 
he was completely shut down. Jalen Knighton got loose a couple times, but, but overall, he's a- as a team, only 3.4 yards per carry for SMU. I mean, you're, you're going to live with that, you know. Uh, yeah, not, not a lot of complaints so far defensively, which is, you know, kind of amazing. So we'll see. And it's two games. And like we said, Arkansas State, not good. SMU, much better. We talked about it. We said, how many times did we say last week we're going to learn a lot more? Well, they they passed another test. So we'll see if they continue to build on it. Like I said, the next few weeks, at least on paper, and Cincinnati maybe shows that they're a little more frisky than a lot of people gave them credit for coming into the year. But the next few weeks, you know, they're not going to be facing Heisman level <laughs> quarterbacks and offenses, but to put it mildly. So before that, until that Texas game, they should have a chance to continue to ramp this thing up and to continue to feel good about it going into that Red River game where after, you know, obviously Texas looked great this weekend winning in Tuscaloosa. So exciting times for this defense right now. It really feels like things are, are different. It does. But, you know, again, we'll tread a little lightly. They got to a great start last year too, and then it you know, kind of got worse and worse and worse and snowballed into being really bad. So we'll, we'll continue to go a little slow on that for now. But shifting over to offense. Weird game um, for Dylan Gabriel, Jeff Levy in this offense. Um Tom, what happened in the middle? I mean, in the middle of this game, it felt like I don't know what, how long it actually was between the two touchdowns. It was it felt like about two full quarters. I guess I should have looked at the timestamps, um, but I mean, they just couldn't really do anything. It was a lot of just running it between the tackles for little to no gain. A lot of third and longs, and a lot of just weird play calls. And I said this on the wrap with James. I'm not going to pretend to be to know football and no play calling like Jeff Levy does. That'd be ridiculous. He's a, a offensive coordinator at a major program like Oklahoma, but it felt like the play calls were weird for me um, on Saturday. I think a lot of fans felt that way too, but it just, it didn't, they never had a good rhythm. They never had a good feel of setting things up, you know what I mean? Down the field from your vantage point, what happened offensively? Cause they went on a, on a stretch that they were, they were just flat out stagnant. Uh, couldn't get anything going. They were stuck on 14 points for a long time. In this game. Yeah, yeah, it was weird, and I, I think it was about two quarters between, yeah, uh, you know, b- between those two touchdowns because they scored with like eight and a half left in the second quarter, and then it's about right. Yeah. Their next answer didn't come until you know SMU scored with twelve minutes left in the fourth, so the answer came like three ish minutes after that. So yeah, yeah. they went about two full quarters without scoring there. Um, yeah, it was just a weird offensive game. Um, like you said, they couldn't really find a rhythm early. Uh, I think they should be. Very, very grateful for Tawi Walker, who kind of provided a little bit of spark there on yeah. the ground. Yeah, yeah. They, they couldn't get much going in the running game early with Marcus Major, but Tawi Walker comes in and that ninety-four yard touchdown drive that they had. I think he had, he had sixty-five yards, maybe rushing on. You no, know, it's funny. Time. You know, when I I'm watching these games from the field, and you know, I don't really have a great. I mean, sometimes you can kind of feel like when a guy's having a big game, but I don't have a great sense, honestly, just hand up of like the stats as the game's going on when I'm on the field, I don't really have access to stats easily. My phone service, a little spotty, things like that. I was surprised when I got back in and Tommy Walker at 117 yards. I did not think it was going to be that big of a number. He had, 70, a, he had a nice game. after contact. Yeah, crazy. Like he, he falls forward, he drags piles. Like that is what you need when your offense is stuck in the mud like Oklahoma's was. But I mean, they got to be grateful that he stepped up the way he did. And frankly, that offense should be very grateful that Peyton Bowen went rogue on that punt attempt <laughs> and just decided to, to take a risk and block that punt because that set them up with a short field that they were able to quickly capitalize on there with that throw from uh, Dylan to Andre Anthony for the first score. Because if they have to go you know, 70, 80 yards on that drive, I don't know that they get that at that point. Because yeah. um, this offense was just – out of rhythm, stagnant. Jeff Lebby said it was a little too conservative on his part. Like he admits that, um, especially in that middle chunk of the game. Um, they just weren't taking many shots downfield like at all. I think Dylan had one pass attempt that went 20-plus yards down the field. I know SMU was trying to you know keep the lid on mm-hmm. things and not give up those big plays, but at some point you got to try to impose your will because that's what your offensive identity is, the, those downfield shots. Um, but they were they were just really conservative. I mean, if you look at Dylan Gabriel's like passing chart, you now I mentioned the one attempt of twenty plus yards. He only had four between ten and nineteen yards downfield. There's a lot of dink and dunk. Yeah, twenty twenty. The other twenty two pass attempts were within nine yards of the line of scrimmage or behind the line of scrimmage. 
Yeah. I think more than half of them were behind the line of scrimmage. Crazy. Um, and that's just not what this offense is. Um, it, yeah, like I said, it, it was a really weird game. But then all of a sudden you look up and Dylan's got four passing touchdowns. And right. Like, and they, oh, and they you know, yeah. they, they cranked it back up in the fourth quarter and they got two touchdowns and made it look easy and put the game away, which was what made it feel weird too because it's like, where was this? Where was this the whole game? Yeah. Shout out Jay Nunez, special teams coach. You know, Lincoln Riley, the previous regime, notoriously didn't have a special teams coach and they were bad on special teams, as you probably would guess. Brent Venables comes in, they bring in Jay Nunez to take over that unit and – you're seeing the fruits of that so far this season. I mean, back-to-back weeks, a massive special teams play. Gavin Freeman houses the punt in the first game. And then, yeah, like you said, Peyton Bowen, who admitted to us after the game that he wasn't actually supposed to go. He just thought he could make it, and he was correct. Got the huge punt block. I mean, that special teams can change games. You yeah. know, coaches say it, but then well, every coach says it, but not every coach backs it up with their actions. And – Oklahoma's backing up with their actions. They put a, a big emphasis on it, brought in Jay Nunez. Whenever we're at those open practices in fall camp, how often do we see them? It's just in the window week you have. We're, t- we're working on punt returns, working on kickoff returns, working on field goals. You're seeing that so far. So shout out Jay Nunez for that as well. And yeah, Tommy Walker, um, is he running back one? I mean, I admit, I mean, right now I'm looking very wrong because I said – when we did kind of the depth chart breakdown that I didn't really put much stock in Tommy Walker being named the starter, uh, just hand up. That's what I, I admitted that. Cause I figured once the bulls actually started flying, they're going to ride Barnes and Sawchuck. We're not seeing those guys at all. Gavin Sawchuck, one carry Javante Barnes, two carries on Saturday. Mm-hmm. It's all Tommy Walker and a little Marcus major right now. Are you surprised by that? As surprised as I am, I, I can't fathom not getting Barnes and Sawchuck more into the mix. These guys are next-level talents that are just sitting on the shelf. I mean, not to discount what Walker's – he's he's playing well. But Marcus Majors had some nice moments. Had that touchdown to ice the game in the passing game. But I just feel like you got to get Barnes and Sawchuck more involved. And Jeff Levy kind of admitted that in his pressure today, but I'll believe it when I see it right now. They're just, they're just not using these guys, which is weird to me. Yeah, I think I'm surprised by the extent – to which they've not been used. Yeah. I, I think we all kind of thought like early in the season, especially, you know, Gavin was, you know, kind of dinged up in fall camp. We saw that, you know, Javante was coming off that foot surgery in the spring that they would kind of slow play, sl- slow play these guys and, you know, kind of ramp them up as big 12 play approached. Mm-hmm. But they barely saw the field in this game in a tight game. Right. They, they played a combined nine snaps, nine. That is yeah. I mean, th- through two games, you know, both Tawi Walker and Marcus Major have more individual snaps than Javante and Gavin combined, which I, I mean, I, I would have bet the house on that. And I would have been bankrupt right now <laughs> Yeah, me too. Asked that before the season. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I do think that, you know, some of it was just, again, them wanting to slow play these guys who were a little bit dinged up and, you know, save them for conference play as the competition ramps up. And I think we'll see them a little bit more this week. You know, like you said, Jeff Levy kind of alluded to that. Like they want to get two and 27 going. They know that those guys are really talented and they can be game changers. But at the same time, you know, it helps to ride the hot hand. I know a lot of, a lot of teams like to do that. And the other night, Tawi Walker was the hot hand. I mean, he was the one moving the change for that offense. Like I said, he averaged five and a half yards per carry in that game. He just kept falling forward. I'm not sure he had any runs that were stopped behind the line of scrimmage. I mean, he he just moves the pile. Like he does not we, we heard it throughout fall camp. Like the first guy does not bring him down. I think he averaged like three point six yards per carry after contact this week. That's a solid number. I mean he mm. he was getting the job done for them. Um I think in the long run they're going to need Javante and Gavin to be those dudes because they have the talent to be those dudes. Yeah. It's just a matter of making sure that they're completely healthy, making sure they're in good shape and getting them to that point of the season. So I think part of it is just, you know, part of it was a little bit by plan based on their health before the season. And the other part of it is that, Hey, Tawi's been running tough. He's earned those snaps. I will say, you know, uh, yeah, admittedly, we're both – and we'll see how the season plays out. I still can't help but feel like by the time we get to, you know, the end of the year, uh, that TCU game, we'll say a season finale, that Barnes and Sawchuck aren't the guys getting the bulk of the carries. But if, if we were wrong on that one, Angel Anthony, you know, 
you and I both really were high on this guy. You, what, what was the the take exactly? He'll be the leading receiver. Yeah, my, 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 my hot take, my bold prediction yeah. the year was that Andre Anthony was going to be the leading receiver for this team when the season ended. And so far, I'm looking pretty good. He's leading them right, in targets. Clearly, leading them in favorite target, at least right yeah. now. Um, these guys, they got chemistry. They just do. They, they seem like guys who – like puzzle pieces that fit together on a football field for whatever, it, for whatever reason that may be. And, you know, we're talking to Angel after the game, who is one of our favorite guys to talk to. And he's talking about it. Dylan Gabriel finishes his post game. He comes over and just, just in, in the middle of Andrew, just had to give him a hug. Just, he just said, I wanted to show my guys some love. Those yeah. two guys are like, they just, they got a good flow, a rapport, whatever you want to call it right now. Seven catches for 76 yards for him and that touchdown at the beginning of the game. Andrew Anthony is looking like the guy. And they got Farouk a little involved. I was a big Farouk guy all off season. I'm not off Farouk by any means he's still a beast clearly that touchdown was beast mode stuff oh that's Shane Anthony is is looking like he's looking like quite the find in the portal right now yeah I mean you look at Andrew Anthony's numbers in this game I mean they, they don't jump off the page 76 yards you know it is what it is like oh, mm-hmm. Oklahoma did not put up you know eye-popping numbers but seven receptions career high 76 yards solid got that that touchdown to get things going you look at his career game log, that's the best game that he's had. Yeah. Since really his like first it was it was his second game, but it was his like first real game at Michigan. It was, you know, midway through his freshman season against Michigan State when he had six catches for 150 yards and two touchdowns, including a 93 yard touchdown on his first career yeah. catch. Right. Um, so I mean, clearly that there there is a comf- you know, a good, you know, rapport. They're comfortable with each other. Um, you know, Andrew Anthony, this decision has been paying off for him. I had a story on our site this morning, uh, kind of about his journey to Oklahoma and how he's kind of fit in. You know, he grew up in Lansing. Um, his dad was a diehard Michigan fan, so he, he kind of always leaned toward Michigan. And, you know, Michigan was his dream school. And, you know, he, that team had success while he was there. They made the college football playoff both of his years. Right. He never started a game. He had his moments here and there. But he transferred to Oklahoma, and so far he's found everything that he was hoping for. Um, he has been that guy through two games. I think we're going to continue to see him kind of grow and shine and how they use him. Um, but he's, he's clearly a, a dynamic playmaker. Um, yeah, he seems he seems really happy to be here. Um, and obviously Oklahoma loves having him. You know, Gabriel loves having him. Um, so, yeah, that take from you was looking good. And I, I was a big Angel Anthony guy as being the third guy. I, I, I was – back in the spring, I thought Farouk, Stoops, Anthony will be your three. And that is your three, but not in the order, I think, that a lot of people uh, thought. He's looked great so far. Um, I will ask you as we're kind of winding down on this game a little bit. Um, offensive line concerns for you? I mean, you saw Savion Bird come out. They were placing with Troy Everett um, for pretty long stretches in this game. Um Walter Rapp picked up some penalties. Tyler Guyton had that really egregious ineligible man downfield penalty. I, I mean, I, I state of the union on the offensive line for you. Uh, it's kind of been a little uneven. I think it's fair to say right now. It wasn't the cleanest game no, by any means. I mean, not. Yeah. Walter Rapp had two penalties. You mentioned that ineligible man on Tyler Guyton that wiped out what was Marcus Major's first touchdown. Yeah, you know, they, they were able to respond pretty quickly from that, so it wasn't ultimately costly. And, you know, Brent Venables said after the game that, you know, Tyra Guyton took ownership of that just just as Venables took ownership of his own sideline interference penalty there. So you like to see that accountability. Um, the Savion Bird thing is weird, man. He he did not have a good start to that game. Um, just completely whiffed and gave up a third down exactly, sack. And then yeah. ne- next drive, we see Troy Everett for extended stretches. I think they're happy with what they saw from Troy Everett. Um I don't know, this is a guy who had some experience last year at Appalachian State, was pretty good there. You don't bring him in to just sit him. I mean, mm-hmm. that's the luxury right. of having a couple of these experienced transfers, guys like him, guys like Caleb Schaefer, that you can feel comfortable plugging in if someone's struggling in a game. I'm curious to see how that kind of plays out moving forward, whether that's still Savion's job, whether Troy ever gets to start this week, whether they're going to be competing in practice throughout the week or what. But – that's why you have this kind of depth. You know, we yeah. heard we heard competitive depth throughout the offseason. This is why you do it, because if someone 
falls off or has a bad game, you can plug the next guy in and not lose a step. I feel like I'm going to continue to bang this drum as well. Um, again, little to nothing from the tight ends and Austin Stogner. Now, Blake Smith did get in the end zone, which was kind of funny. Um, good for him. First collegiate touchdown on that little drag right. He was wide open. Um, but that was two yard. That was a two yard touchdown. And Stogner had one catch for three yards after having no catches in the opener. Um, it's not going to matter if they keep winning and, and everything, but I just I, I said it many times over the offseason. We did it. We did our tight end breakdown. I said it last week, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to. I'm going to sound like a broken record, but you just I feel like this offense is not going to be at its best until Austin Stogner is a legitimate threat in the passing game. And through two games, he just has not been. Um, so that's something to monitor for me. That's more maybe a personal thing. Maybe other people like don't really care it, but that. For me, I just I, I want to see more of that, and he's been just non-existent. I mean, one catch for three yards is nothing, obviously. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I think I think part of that might have just been with the way that Levy was calling that game. Like and that's part of it. Yeah. Right. Again, again, all those short little dink and dumps. Like they they ran a lot of twelve personnel. Um, you look at the snap counts. Both Stogner and Blake Smith played a lot of snaps together. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it just happened to be that Blake Smith was the guy that wound up getting the touchdown. And hey, man, kudos to Blake Smith because through two games at Oklahoma, he's just like obliterated like the numbers that he had in three years at Texas A&M. <laughs> he's fitting in right in like a glove. Yeah, it, 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 a great touchdown catch in the spring game, and he's showing no fluke, man. I get out yeah. there and I can, I can make it happen. So yeah, shout yeah, out Blake Smith. I mean, for, yeah, for it, it, it's it's not a lot, but you know. It's also no small thing that he's got a couple of receptions. I think he had a 28 yarder in that opener gets, gets his first mm-hmm. career touchdown uh, this past week. So, I mean, good for him, especially, you know, he, he caught that touchdown. I was looking at the you know scoreboard across the country. Um, he caught that touchdown basically as his former team was down by like 15 <laughs> way through the fourth quarter to Miami. So, lose. Yeah. so pr- probably a, a, a feel good day for him all around. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. They, I think for this offense to be at its best, they need more involvement from the tight ends in the passing game, and it'll it'll be interesting to kind of track how that plays out in the coming weeks because I don't think yeah. this offense has hit its peak by any means. Um, you know, even in the opener when we saw them kind of revving their engines engines throughout, it was still a little vanilla. It felt like, um, but again, you, you don't want to show everything right out of the gate against non-conference opponents, especially a team like Arkansas State. For sure. Um, last thing on the offense, and then we'll kind of put a bow on this uh, this game. What do we think about the Arnold package? Um, you know, <laughs> you know he, they brought in Jackson Arnold, so Arnold didn't throw a pass. Obviously, everybody watched the game knows that. He didn't throw a pass. He came in, he ran the ball four times for 11 yards. Um, he also handed it off a couple times. I don't know how many actual total snaps he was in there for. Um, but they never let him throw. Um, it's clear. I mean, obviously that was a statement that there's at least an intention of Oklahoma to use Jackson Arnold in 2023 in not just a garbage time role. Like they, they want to get him into the mix. Did you like it? I can't say I liked it. I mean, I was waiting. I just kept waiting for Arnold to throw the ball. I mean, that, that I, every time he came in, I was thinking, is this where we're going to get that Tebow pop pass type thing for, but they know they just kept running him up the middle and it kind of was, uh, you know, a dichotomy, you know, of the whole game in terms of, or a microcosm of the whole game, I should say that they just kind of stagnant, not doing anything special. It was kind of the same play over and over. It felt like, I don't know. I, I felt like it felt a little forced to me. Did you like the Arnold aspect of this? I want to see how that continues to develop and evolve. Um, you know, Brent Venable said after the game that there's more that they're going to continue to add to that package. You know, yeah. Everybody knows that Jackson Arnold can spin it. We saw that in the opener. It was just kind of weird going from seeing him go 11 for 11 in, in his first opportunity sure. in that opener to not even attempting a pass in week two. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, you, you mentioned that Tim Tebow pop pass. That's all I could think of. Not, not necessarily the pop pass, but, you know, you look back to that 2006 Florida team, Tim Tebow coming in as that you know highly, highly thought of freshman, Chris Leak, a experienced veteran presence as that starting quarterback. It just reminded me so much of that situation where 
the way they were using him as this kind of sub package guy for short yardage situations. Um, that's how it was on Saturday. I think that they'll continue to kind of grow that and get some more out of it. Um, again, they, they don't want to show everything that they have in these mm-hmm. early season games. Sure, true. They yeah. know Jackson Arnold can throw it. It's not like, oh, we're, we're, we're afraid that what, what's going to happen if we, if we, you know, yeah. ask him to pass the ball here. But I don't think it was the most effective usage of that package. Um, and I think some of it is, you know, Jackson's still learning how to run that part of it. You know, sure. Randall said, again, he's going to learn when to bounce it out, when to keep it tight inside. Um, cause obviously they had that fourth down attempt with him there that came up short in the red zone. Uh, and you know, it's kind of a learning, learning opportunity for them to kind of figure out how they want to use them. But like you said, it seems like a pretty clear statement of intent that, Hey, yeah, right. We have this guy in our back pocket and we're not afraid to shot him out there on the field. I mean, we saw him on the second possession of the game. Right, right, right after that Peyton Bowen block punt, he came out there. He took his first snap. He ran it up the middle. Dylan Gabriel immediately came in the next play. Weirdly enough, they were both on the field for that second. Yeah, I, I thought they were going to yeah. throw it to him. I was yeah, like, oh, I, was I don't know if that was by design or if like a receiver was like late, you know, trying yeah. to come on the field. So they just told Jackson to stay out there. But it's something to keep an eye on. I had my camera ready. I was ready yeah. for them to throw it over the <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I mean, Oklahoma fans obviously have seen this before. Landry Jones and Blake Bell did this once upon a time with the Bell Dozer package. And it always felt like at that time, younger Josh, it felt like Landry Jones got a little out of rhythm sometimes when they would do that. They'd bring in Blake Bell for a snap or two and put him back. I- I'm curious to ask Dylan Gabriel when we get the opportunity. I almost asked him after the game, but I had some other things. And if I, we usually talk to him every Monday, so probably should get a chance to talk to him today. Um, is it hard to – stay in rhythm and, and everything when you're coming off for a snap or two and then going back like that. I don't know. I, I'm not a huge fan of that, generally speaking. Um, so I'm curious to see how that develops more as we go along. Um, any final thoughts on this game? I mean, Oklahoma obviously did cover the spread in this game. I and mean, they beat a pretty good team. A reason, I mean, I would say probably, what, a middle-of-the-pack Big 12 team? I mean, SMU's better than some of the teams Oklahoma's going to play in Big 12 play. They won by 17 points. They got a little hairy, but they responded. You got to like that. Oklahoma fans, SMU cut that into three, and that, that crowd felt a little nervous there for just a minute. Oklahoma went down and got a big score, then got stops and, and put it away. I don't know. I mean, how do you feel right now? Kind of, I asked James this after the game, but just kind of mood tracker, I guess, for, for the team right now. How should they feel after a couple of games? I think they should feel pretty good, all things considered. Like, like yeah. we said, the defense has been lights out so far. Um, I think the most promising thing, like you mentioned, is the first time this team was faced with adversity this early yeah, season. Yeah, exactly. They responded. And Brent Venable said after the game, he's not sure that last year's team wins that game. After SMU, you know, after SMU cuts into three with 12 minutes left, you know, they took a punch and they responded with a 74 yard drive after that. Mm-hmm. And then the defense gets a stop. They score again, defense gets another stop. That is how you close out games. That is how you win these close games. And again, that's just growth from year one to year two. Sure. And you know, some of the players even said after the game, like, yeah, not sure we win that one last year either, but they they bowed up, they answered the call, and you know, they showed that you know they have that fortitude to, you know, like get again, when they get hit in the face, what yeah. are you gonna do? Everyone has an answer until they get hit in the face. Sure. No, I mean, it, it, that it, answer after it was, yeah, I mean, they were 0 5 in one score games last year. And obviously, this wasn't a one score game. I mean, it was in the fourth quarter, but it wasn't because they, they finished so strong. So, weird game. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not overly concerned about the offense yet. That stretch was concerning, I think. But when they ramped it back up and they needed it, they two two easy touchdown drives. So, I, you know, we'll, we'll see how things look. We're not going to learn. You know, we're kind of back to, I think Tulsa's not. Tulsa is better than Arkansas State, but they're the next worst team on the schedule uh, for Oklahoma this year. So probably not going to. They're probably going to win by a lot on Saturday. We'll we'll break down the game in full on Thursday. So I don't know how much more we're going to learn this week, but you know I'm not too worried about the offense just yet. Although that stretch was puzzling, and so we'll see uh, where things go from here. But two and zero is two and zero, and they covered the spread a couple times. So defense looks really good. So that that's that's something you got to like if you're an Oklahoma fan right now. So. Um, to kind of put the final bow in this game, all right, let's go ahead and do it. Let's rip the Band-Aid off. 
Um, after the game, everybody has seen it by now. It was a circus. It completely took over post game. Everybody in uh, you know on the OU beat. You know, usually after the game is over, everybody's kind of talking about the game, what the other, some of the other games going on. Obviously, Texas, Alabama were playing. There's a lot of people talking about that. But the dominant convo was, did you see Art Bryles out there? So Art Bryles, which, again, I think most everybody knows, but just in case you don't, is Jeff Levy's father-in-law. Jeff Levy's married to Art Bryles' daughter. Has been for a while. They have a couple kids. He coached them at Baylor. Like, they, it's not like a new thing. They've, been, they've known each other a long time. They're family. They brought him down to the field after the game. He was rocking OU gear, um, as you might expect. Didn't play well. A lot of OU fans did not like that, and that's completely reasonable in my opinion. And that's all this is. It's my opinion. It's an, it's an opinionated thing. Um, this is a guy who is as disgraced of a college football coach as there is in at least recent history, if not all time. Right? He hasn't held another job since everything that happened at Baylor, the scandal. Um, it's not really a guy you want associated with your program wearing your gear uh, on the field after a game. And some people talked about how quick after the game. It was right after the game. I mean, we're talking immediately after the game he was there. I mean, it's literally before we could even get to the postgame room. He was out there. Mm-hmm. Um, just not a great look. And Jeff Levy addressed it today at his press conference. He apologized for it. Said Brent Venables and Joe Casilio and talked to him about it. Not going to happen again. I don't know, Tom. I mean, like I said, I, I think everybody's moving past it. We're not going to, you know, I've kind of said my piece about it. Just how you felt this all went. It, it wasn't great. You know, it's kind of a shame because Oklahoma's off to a pretty good start under Brent Venables. They've actually done a pretty nice job at keeping clean, you know, off the field, quote unquote. Like they haven't really had a lot of off field issues under Brent Venables. But you have something like this in week two is kind of, uh, as Jeff Levy put it today, it's a distraction. It's an un, it's an, you know, uh, whatever the right word is, it, it was self-inflicted wound distraction. I mean, nobody made this happen. So I don't know. How, how did you feel about how this all kind of played out the last couple of days? Yeah, it, it wasn't great. Um, I mean, again, o- Oklahoma knew when they hired Jeff Levy that Art Bryles was his father-in-law. I mean, they're you know, sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Joe so like put out a statement when, when they hired Levy and Levy put out a statement at that time too, you know, saying that, you know, his experience at Baylor is informed, you know, how he approaches everything now. So it's not like this is anything new. And I think it was very telling when Josie put out that statement at 11 o'clock on a Saturday. First off, you, you never want your AD to have to put out a statement at 11 <laughs> o'clock on a Saturday night after. Yeah. But reading his statement, I mean, clearly he was disappointed. He said this was something he never thought he would have to worry about because there were clear boundaries that were previously agreed upon. To some extent, that is a you know breaking of trust in some sense. Yeah, um, and I'm and I'm sure Levy heard an earful from Joe C and Brent Venables, who Brent clearly did not seem pleased about it when he he found out right before he walked in the post game press conference. He said it was being dealt with, but he he was unaware of it, and mm-hmm. he just did not seem pleased about that because again, clearly defined boundaries. I'm sure when they hired Jeff Levy about hey, this guy cannot be around our program. We like we understand he is your family, but we can't be associated with him. Like having him on the field is not a good look, especially in Oklahoma gear. Right. Now I'm not right. saying he shouldn't be able to see his family, but yeah, you know, and that's, that's on, the, thing. on, on like, the field after a game or before a game is it, it, it should not be happening. And you know, Jeff Levy came out with a prepared statement today. It was, you know, again, it was a prepared statement. He apologized for it. He said it's not going to happen again. It was much better than his response after the game when he seemed kind of dismissive of it and said, that's my father-in-law. That's the grandfather. That was, that didn't help. That that wasn't handled well. But Oklahoma clearly, you know, got this message to him. They want to move past it because again, it's just a distraction from a team that, you know, pulled out a, what should be a good win. um, And is off to a two and O start, but yeah, just not, not what you want coming out of, out of a win that where your team showed you something that it might not have showed you a year ago. Yeah, for sure. No, hundred percent. And I do actually kind of sympathize with Levy in some regards in that he, he is his father-in-law. I mean, that, that's, that is an awkward spot to be it. If he says, you know, hey, I want to come out to the game this weekend, you know, that, that is a, that is an awkward spot for him, you know? And so, yeah. but I, I, again, I do, like you said, I don't think anybody, I, I'm sure some people would prefer that he doesn't even come to the games at all, but I, I don't, I kind of acknowledge that that's probably a little unrealistic. He is family and everything. But 
you know, there's a difference between coming to the game and being in a suite, you know, out of out of sight, not worrying what you owe you stuff like he's almost on staff or something, and coming to the field right after the game. I mean, there there are there are boundaries there. There there was a way to go about it, and I I, I also just can't help but, I mean, wouldn't you think that Jeff Levy and and Bryles both would kind of know how this would go over whenever they did it? Like how unless they were extremely naive. Um, yeah, but so that, that's a little strange to me too because it feels like it was an outright just kind of they had to know the blowback was going to happen which is which what makes it even a little more weird yeah again the fact that there were predetermined boundaries put right in place we don't there, know the extent of that, that. Yeah. You, know, you know look it, it's his father-in-law but he needs to understand what differentiates his father-in-law from a lot of other people sure. I mean, sure. our is a coaching pariah He's not had a job in college football since being fired before the 2016 season when that sexual assault investigation came out. The jobs that he has had, he's coached overseas in Europe. He's coached a high school team for a couple of years. Grambling State, an FCS program, tried to hire him as offensive coordinator a year and a half ago. He resigned within five days because of all the blowback. Yeah, the backlash. It, yeah. They, they, they know who he is and what his reputation is. And you know Jeff Levy needs to know better. 100%. And so uh, the good thing is I do think it's done with, at least for now, obviously, if, if something else happens, then I don't, I think uh, it won't go, it will go even worse than this went, but I do think it's done for now. I think we can all move, move along, get back to football, which is nice. Um, you know, let me apologize for it. Like I said, read the statement. You can watch that on the YouTube channel. It's right at the beginning. First thing he said, um, and uh, sounds like everyone's going to move past it for now. So hopefully that's it. That's that. Uh, I know nobody, we want to talk about football. We want to talk about the team. We don't, you know, so hopefully that's that for, you know, forever on, on that front. Um, all right. Uh, I think we're just about done here uh, for this one. Last thing, Tulsa this weekend, like we said, 2.30 kick on Saturday. Uh, first road game again, if you can call it that. It's obviously it is a road game. It's not going to be enormous up in Tulsa, but it will be probably heavy OU fans. Obviously, just a short trip in state, things like that. Um, we're going to do the full game breakdown on Thursday, but I guess some just early Monday thoughts, Tom, here. Obviously, Former OU OC Kevin Wilson's the head coach there, which is kind of fun. Um, should get some fun Brent Venable stories, uh, I would imagine, about Wilson tomorrow. But, you know, I don't know. Tulsa's not great. Obviously, they're in the first year of a new head coach. They got throttled by Washington last weekend. This should be another opportunity for Oklahoma to work a lot of guys in and win pretty big, I'd imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think there's going to be another week, kind of similar to week one, where it's Oklahoma versus Oklahoma more yeah. than it is Oklahoma against that opponent. Um, you know, they'll, they'll have to kind of adjust to, you know, their first experience with the road game this season and, you know, everything that comes with preparing for not being at home, even though I do expect a very Oklahoma-friendly crowd. Yeah. But, you know, I want to see Oklahoma clean up a lot of those, you know, details that we saw lead to some of these struggles this past week, especially when it comes to penalties um, want to see how they get, you know, Javante Barnes and Gavin Sawchuk kind of get going as we, you know, inch closer to the start of Big 12 play. And again, just want to see the defense continue to keep it up and develop some of that pass rush and, you know, how this passing game continues to evolve because those dink and dunk plays, that's, that's not going to cut it. They need to open yeah. things up. And, you know, even if the opposing team is, you know, trying to take away your strength, at some point, you just need to impose your will. You need to do what you need to do. 100%. So look forward to it. It'll be fun to get up there to T-Town on uh, Saturday, my hometown. Um, so look forward to that. Hit a quick trip on, on the way through. Um, look forward to that. And again, Thursday show, we'll do the full breakdown. We'll also, obviously, James Jackson will rejoin us for that. Colin Ken will be on the show on Thursday as well. It is some recruiting talk. A lot of visitors were in town for the SMU game. Didn't even have time to really get into any kind of Nigel Smith today, but another big, obviously, defensive line recruit. They continue to really do what they need to do in that area. Todd Bates and Del Chavis are crushing it. Um, so we'll get into that with Colin and stuff on Thursday's show. But uh, in the meantime, Oklahoma.247sports.com. Tons of reaction coming out of the SMU game uh, is there for you. With some more still on the way, but also the page being turned to Tulsa. Keep an eye out for lots of great content coming up in the next few days as we get ready for week three. Uh, already going to be a quarter of the way through after this weekend, believe it or not, in the regular season at least, with the Sooners – and the Golden Hurricanes. So stick with us on Thursday for our full game preview. That's it for now. Tom, any last things? Anything want to get off your chest? No? no good, man. <laughs> good. I'm always like, I'm always wary at the end of shows. I'm always like, 
Do they have anything else they wanted to say that I'm cutting them off? So that's it. All right, we'll be back. It, uh, it, I, I will say it's been nice yeah. to kind of work on the two man game, get out of that three man weave for for a show. Um, yeah, miss having James on here, but uh, we'll get him uh, back. Yeah, I think we had a nice give and go today. Yeah, well, that will, yeah, like you said, nice little two man game. Um. So, yeah, that's it. We'll be back Thursday, full ensemble on Thursday with Colin Kennedy and James Jackson, recruiting talk, and then Tulsa game preview. We'll keep an eye out for that one coming up in just a few days. For Tom Green, I'm Josh Calloway. Signing off for now, we'll see you Thursday back for another edition of the Sooners Illustrated podcast.